All right, uh, ILM 3103.02F, uh, capacitance, thermal dispersion, optical and magnetostrictive uh, level devices. So uh, from this point forward, basically every lecture is going to be a, a, a device or a collection of devices. Uh, and we're going to look at more or less all the same uh, different things here. The idea, of course, is to build a repertoire of knowledge so that you can uh, be better advised when selecting different uh, devices for different applications. So moving ahead with this lecture, describing the principles, applications, and installation requirements of the following four devices. So capacitive, thermal, optical, and magnetostrictive. We'll be looking at the same things for all of the different devices. So we start out with capacitance instruments here. And those of you who are electricians, uh, this will be a little bit of a flashback to some compact capacitor science here. Uh, and it is um, really just a large scale version of uh, a small capacitor. Capacitive instruments, uh, of course, measure the electrical capacity between the wall of the vessel and the probe. The vessel wall and the probe are the plates in the capacitor and the vessel content. The process medium is the dielectric material, and we mentioned dielectric uh, material the other day. And dielectric is a, a term that's related to the conductivity, essentially, of uh, material. So as the level changes, uh, the capacitance uh, throughout the range also changes, and that's how we get measurement out of using capacitance. And we'll show you what that looks like, uh, theoretical math and real math. So we start out looking at some math that's associated with uh, what we typically call a parallel plate capacitor. So it's the, a very simple uh, kind of model, uh, and it uses a formula. This formula here, uh, don't worry, will evolve from this into something more relevant as we get through the uh, lecture here. But uh, if we're used to talking about a parallel plate capacitor, and those of you who are electrical would have done this similar theory in that, uh, our capacitance is uh, made up of a uh, dielectric con constant, the plate area, and the distance between the plates. And the amount of charge. Uh, or capacitance depends on basically these three things. So the area of the plate, the distance between them, and the type of insulating material, which is uh, another way to consider uh, a dielectric, right? It's either a, a good conductor or a bad conductor or a good insulator or a bad insulator. So uh, the dielectric is this insulating material. And we'll look at the characteristics of some of them uh, when we get there. Okay, so here's that. Uh, parallel plate style capacitor, the basic theoretical style capacitor here. And it's two plates with some uh, AC voltage applied between them that causes uh, ions to go back and forth between these different plates. And then we have process medium uh, that goes in, in between here. Uh, when the tank is empty, of course, it's air between the plates. And then when the tank is uh, full, it's going to have some type of a, a fluid typically, or solid, possibly, uh, in between these plates. Uh, and whatever that material is, is going to have an effect on the capacitance that's generated between the plates. And that's the science behind it. So again, power supply, uh, AC frequency between 50 and 40 kilohertz. Uh, and this is why you'll also sometimes hear of capacitance referred to as radio frequency level measurement, uh, because these are in the radio uh, frequency range. So again, uh, AC source. Uh, in here and the electricity kind of going back and forth. Okay, for continuous level measurement using uh, capacitance probes, uh, the math gets a little bit uh, trickier, ultimately getting to the point where we're going to be able to do calculations based on actual uh, actual probes. And you'll see that the technology changes from the theoretical uh, square plate style capacitor to one that's more representative of a real device because uh, the real devices are actually probes uh, and they're long and they're cylindrical and they're not square plates. So uh, we're, we will be working our way up to that. But here's again, just uh, some more background on, on the science. Oops, okay, so here are the uh, following formulas used to calculate capacitance and from that we can uh, calculate level. So here's that parallel 
plate capacitor again. And this is uh, same variables that we talked about earlier here. Um, you'll see uh, some numbers as we as we move through here. Um, and these are constants uh, that will be uh, given to you. And these are based on the uh, physical build uh, of the plates. So different, uh, different style capacitance systems will have uh, a different number here and, and not something that you need to memorize. Um, they will they will be given for you. So there's different numbers for square plates, there's different number for uh, probe style, and then there's different numbers for metric and imperial. Um, but essentially they're all they're all basically the same. The capacitance is the is a function of uh, the dielectric and the plate area and the distance between the plates. So by uh, bringing the plates closer together or further apart or making them bigger and smaller, uh, we can change the value of capacitance in a, in a given situation. Um, of course, that doesn't happen in real life. It's the dielectric that changes uh, in between, um, that changes the capacitance number for us, but there is that relationship. Okay, 8.854 in this case is what they call a proportionality constant. Uh, and that's for a, a parallel plate capacitor. So again, don't have to worry about it too much because we are working our way up to cylindrical probes. Okay, dielectric constants we've mentioned a few times in the last couple of days here. Um, materials that are considered to be conductive have a dielectric constant greater than about 10. Um, materials that are considered conductive uh, are also uh, using the measurement of conductivity, which is Siemens or micro Siemens, uh, Siemens per centimeter, uh, just a couple of units that are related to conductivity and dielectric. But for our purposes, uh, we'll be using numbers uh, here for our K values. And the important ones to, to pay attention to here is that air is essentially one. Um, I don't have nitrogen on here, but another one that's often used uh, as a zero is, is nitrogen, which is uh, 1.0005. So air is typically what you're going to be having between your plates when your tank is empty. So that's one that you obviously are going to want to know. And then when your vessel is full, there's a different process medium here and their relative dielectrics are listed in a table like this. Um, they will generally be provided to you uh, in uh, a question. So there is no requirement to uh, use up a bunch of brain cells to memorize different dielectric constants. Um, but again, the common one, of course, is air, uh, and you should be able to remember that one. Okay, so here's some more theoretical stuff on, on how this uh, plate capacitor works here. So this is mathematical proof that this works, and we're not going to run through the math. Uh, this isn't the type of math that we're, we're doing in here, but uh, what we want to point out here is that the overall capacitance is a function of the capacitance between what we're calling a theoretical uh, measurement at C1 and a, and a theoretical measurement at C2. And you see basically what they're saying here is that as the vessel fluid fills up and uh, covers the plate or uh, gets in between the two plates here, this dielectric of the process fluid is going to generate a higher capacitance in this range of the plate, whereas the other range of the plate where C1 is, is still in air, which will have a dielectric of one and generally a lower capacitance number. And if we took this number and this number and added them together, it would be a representation of where this level is uh, somewhere along this plate. So it's just a distribution of capacitance basically between different measuring points on the plate, theoretically. Okay, the total increase in capacitance is proportional to the increase in level. So this only shows a couple of different points, but again, it's uh, just theoretical to let you know kind of kind of how that works. Okay, typical capacitive measurements here. Uh, the transmitter basically levels uh, measures the capacitance between the plates, and as the level rises, the capacitance increases. So this reinforces the theory from the previous slide. Um, the URV and LRV can be calibrated with the capacitance measurement. So there's a couple of different ways we can do that. We'll talk about um, capacitance measurements later. So you can either do it in real life and measure the capacitance uh, and do like wet calibration sort of thing. Or if you know the capacitance uh, values for low and high, you can use a capacitance decade box to simulate uh, the process. 
Um, again here, uh, just showing you the different uh, relationships in terms of how these probes look in relation to uh, how the capacitance builds, builds up here. And it's just kind of mathematical here. And we're showing that uh, the combination of C2 and C1 is going to be greater than the combination of C3 and C4 because there is a, a larger amount of C3 exposed to a lower dielectric constant than there is here. And C2 is exposed to a lot more of a higher dielectric uh, constant material than it is over here. And then mathematically, again, it's a proportional relationship. This brings us to reality, which is uh, cylindrical probes. This is the uh, standard design of industrial capacitance uh, devices here. Um, and you see that we have a bunch of different measurements that are associated um, with these probes. So again, we have uh, similar variables here, uh, dielectric constant. Uh, in this case, we have A, which is the outside diameter, B is the inside diameter, L, uh, the length in inches, and um, pay attention as we go through this because you'll see calculations uh, both in metric and in, in imperial. Uh, capacitance, of course, still capacitance measured in picofarads. And here's the little point I want to point out to you here when we're doing calculations uh, for probes that are in uh, metric, uh, we use this formula uh, and this constant. And when we're doing uh, measurements that are in inches, we end up using uh, this particular constant here. Um, the good news is I believe all the math that we do is in uh, metric dimensions. So this will be in uh, this will be in centimeters. This will be in centimeters. This will usually be in meters. And the most challenging part about it is making sure that you can accurately convert uh, all these centimeter measurements into meter measurements because of uh, all the all the metric math is based on the meter. Okay, so here's an example of what such questions could look like here. Uh, a two meter long, one and a half centimeter diameter capacitance probe is centered in a one meter diameter vessel. Uh, what is the capacitance of the probe when the vessel is empty? What is the capacitance of the probe when the vessel is full of naphthalene? So uh, that example of me providing uh, dielectric constants of naphthalene is, I think, 20. I can't remember what it was. We can go back to our chart over here and we can find naphthalene, which isn't even in here. So wonderful. No big deal. Okay, so let's punch, punch this into the formula. Again, this is in uh, meters here. So we'll be using the metric constant, which is 24.16, and then plugging our, our values into our formula here. So when we're empty, uh, dielectric constant is 1.005. The length of our probe is 2 meters. Uh, log 10, um, if you're using the uh, standard calculator, your log button that you'll see uh, on your calculator is naturally a log 10, so you don't have to punch in this 10. Uh, the way I like to do it is I like to do uh, 1 meter divided by whatever the lower, whatever this division is, uh, get that number, and then store it, and then I'll go log, and then enter that number. Um, I don't believe that usually works out, but probably a good idea to try it. Um, but at any rate, this log 10 can be uh, can be done just pressing the log button on your calculator. It is naturally, uh, they call log 10 the natural log, and that's what the button uh, does for you. So you don't have to put in that subscript. Uh, so again, um, one meter from the uh, one meter vessel and the diameter of our probe is 1.5 centimeters. So by moving off our uh, decimal places here, we get it into meters. So we do that calculation and we end up uh, with a uh, capacitance value of 26.51 picofarads when the vessel is empty. When the vessel is full, uh, the only thing that changes here is the dielectric constant of the process uh, medium, what's, what the probe is sensing. So it's, in this case, uh, naphthalene is 2.5. Uh, same math, all the numbers. Otherwise, we run it out uh, on the calculator and we get 66.23 picofarads for a capacitance measurement when the vessel is full. So those are the first two parts of the math 
uh, that we're expected to take away from this ILM. The last portion um, deals with what we call sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity is just uh, a rating how many picofarads per meter is what we're, we're gunning for here. So what is uh, what is the sensitivity formula? The change in capacitance over the change in length. So we have uh, our full value capacitance 66 picofarads. We have our empty value uh, capacitance of 26 picofarads. Subtract those two together, uh, divide by two meters, which is the length of our probe, and our sensitivity is then expressed as 19.86 picofarads per meter. Um, one of the things that is uh, changed here theoretically to real life is now that we're using a round probe, uh, we're no longer talking about the theoretical distance between the plates uh, by moving uh, flat parallel plates, you know, closer and farther apart. Uh, we're talking about where do we mount that probe in the vessel uh, and what effect does that have uh, on our measurements because remember the vessel wall uh, acts as one of the plates of the capacitance um, system. So where we place it is going to have some effect here. And this little graph represents uh, that relationship between the probe location and its proximity uh, to the wall. So you'll see increasing the distance from the wall decreases the sensitivity, decreasing the distance from the wall, or essentially pushing the plates together, increases the sensitivity. Oops. One way of uh, increasing sensitivity thereby is to move the probe closer to the vessel wall. Okay, you can also use a two probe system to increase the sensitivity. Uh, one is the measurement probe and one is the ground. So in this application, the vessel uh, is not acting as the second plate anymore. The second plate is actually built into the probe. Uh, this can be useful also um, if you have a vessel that is not metal. Uh, because, of course, in order to, to work, the, the plate uh, has to be metal. Um, so this uh, two-probe system is also a workaround for uh, non-conductive uh, vessels. But again, increasing the sensitivity, either move the probe closer to the wall or use one of these two-probe uh, setups. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, three other uh, different types of probes. And again, as we go through these different types of probes, uh, the reason that they're being mentioned in individually, of course, is they have specific applications in, wet, in which they're uh, best suited. Uh, the variations in technology are, are marginal uh, at best, but there are some uh, as we work our way through here. So again, uh, moving through these, pay particular attention to uh, differences in construction and applications are the main focus. So first, bare capacitance probe, the simplest type of probe here, represented by this wonderful, uh, overly elaborate uh, picture here. Again, just representing kind of kind of what's going on here. This is what they uh, kind of look like. They're bare, as you can see. It's just uh, metal for the most part. And some theoretical math here uh, to prove uh, to prove how they work. And again, saying the overall capacitance is the sum of the different uh, measurements throughout the, the length of the probe. Uh, C1 is the uh, reference value, and then C2 and C3 are the uh, actual changing variables here. Um, and the bare probes are used for non-conductive fluids only, granular solids, which are also non-conductive, and can be used for the interface measurement between two non-conductive fluids. So you'll see a uh, a theme here, uh, non-conductive stuff. Uh, again, I think that has to do with the fact that this is a, a metal probe. Uh, and I guess maybe shorting comes into play, but long story short, bare capacitance probe, generally non-conductive stuff. Coated capacitance probe, the second style that we look at here. Oops. Um, good for conductive and non-conductive fluids. Uh, good for corrosives and also can be used for the measurement interface of conductive with non-conductive or two non-conductives. Um, as we move through here, 
Um, pay attention to the fact that I don't think we're going to see a device that is used for two conductive uh, liquids in an interface application here. So again, applications are kind of everything here. So again, uh, con construction here is uh, a little bit different because we now have some capacitance that introduced by the coating. Uh, and you can see this here, it looks kind of like it's got a, a Teflon sort of coating on it. Last but not least here is the sheathed probe. Oops, got way ahead of myself there. Uh, these are good for non-metal vessels. Um, maybe I got confused when I said the dual probe. You might have to verify that. I could have misled you when I talked about the two probe uh, for non-metals, but definitely sheathed uh, for non-metal vessels, uh, also non-linear vessels. And this has good sensitivity by uh, producing uh, its own ground. It's just one of the characteristics of a, of a sheathed probe. But uh, by and large, the main reason people would pick a sheath probe over one of the previous two was because they had a vessel uh, that is not a metal vessel. Okay, uh, they can be coated or bare depending on the conductivity of the process. Uh, and again, um, this is like a tube around a tube, so it kind of works as a all in one. Uh, this is kind of like its own little vessel, so it does its measurements within uh, the cavity of the probe here. Uh, again, not having a metal vessel, uh, you can't use it as a plate, so it provides uh, its own plate essentially with the probe uh, in the inner portion of it, and then some space around the probe here where the process medium uh, should be able to get in. They should actually show that in the picture, but they don't. Okay, uh, sheath probe sensitivity. So this is a uh, similar math, nothing new and exciting here. Um, Two meter sheath probe is just measured not going at 20 degrees. Uh, sheath has a diameter of six centimeters and the probe has a diameter of 1.5 centimeters. The only reason we're doing this exercise here uh, is to make you aware that, you know, we're talking about a probe that is all in one. So instead of using a, a number like one meter or two meters or three meters for the diameter of the tank, which is the second plate of the capacitor, we're now using uh, the measurement of the probe uh, physically itself. Um, and so the numbers are much smaller and really the only drill here is uh, making sure you get your uh, conversions into uh, meters so your math, uh, your math works out and bad for me for not putting these uh, into meters. Uh, but the math otherwise is exactly the same. Uh, the constant metric or, or standard, uh, air, naphthalene, length of the probe, uh, outside diameter of the probe, inside diameter of the probe, so lower range, upper range, and sensitivity, same math as we had earlier. Okay, this isn't mentioned in the ILM anymore, but I'll throw it out there just because uh, this could still occur in a test uh, somewhere, but uh, they do make uh, proximity probes uh, that can measure uh, solids on a conveyor belt. Uh, again, these are uh, not in the ILM anymore. Um, unique application. Uh, they got a pretty small range, I think uh, 12 to 24 inches or something like that, um, but an interesting application nonetheless. Okay, uh, little, little, de little details here, and I guess a red flag maybe should go out if I didn't take it out of the PowerPoint. It's probably because I think you're going to want to know this. Okay, so the area of the sense of plate uh, for one of these box probes is sized for a given application, so a conveyor belt or, or whatever it is, uh, generally used for a small span. Again, I said 12 to 24, um, the fact here is uh, 4 to 24 or something like that. And the capacitance change for these is nonlinear. Again, not really fair for me to throw this in there, but it is in the PowerPoint, so I'm, uh, I've covered my bases. Okay, calibration. Uh, three ways that you can calibrate a capacitance probe, basically. Um, dry method using a capacitance simulator, like a decade box, to apply calculated uh, lower range and upper range values to set your milliamps. Um, the best uh, way, of course, the, uh, the wet calibration method, where you can uh, actually use the process to fill it to lower range and upper range and set those values. Or the third option is factory calibrated, where it's based on drawings and calculations. That's for, I guess, kind of all of them, but more or less uh, analog ones. 
Uh, they have pointed out in this ILM uh, particularly that because we're now talking uh, largely about smart uh, devices uh, in third year and fourth year as we move forward here, uh, we want you to know uh, that if it is smart, like other smart transmitters, the calibration is really a, a sensor and output trim. And it's basically a, a practice of making things match up. So um, sensor trim, um, by definition, is matching the capacity that's provided. So if we're supplying it uh, with a decade box, um, we want to make sure that it's the same number that we're seeing on our communicator. And if it isn't, then we got to do some uh, adjusting. And that's what we call a sensor trim. And the output trim uh, on the other end of the device uh, is matching the transmitter output to that seen by uh, the communicator. So again, just making sure that um, what the transmitter says is 20 milliamps is actually what we're measuring on the communicator. Installation, a couple different ways, a uh, couple different ways to install these things. So first one is a internal mount, uh, as we see here, uh, which is which is nice. We have all the thermal mass here, so we don't have uh, problems with temperature changes due to ambient outside air. It takes a long time uh, for the temperature to change in a bigger vessel. The bigger it is, the longer it takes. At back to T1 time and process care. Um, problem is maintenance can be difficult. If this is a pressurized vessel, for example, uh, you'd have to block it all in in order to pull this probe out in order to do some work. Uh, second method, uh, cage mounted or bridle mounted here where we have some isolation valves. Uh, drain valves, vent valves, and if we needed to work on this, it's simply a matter of uh, isolating it and pulling the probe. The process can carry on uh, its merry way. Okay, the downside, of course, uh, much smaller, so less thermal mass, and it's hanging out there in the breeze. Uh, so especially in Alberta here, um, unless it's insulated, maybe traced, uh, you could have uh, temperature swings that may affect your measurements. Okay, uh, operations, uh, and specifically with interface, because I, I believe that one of the more common uses for um, these capacitance probe is for measuring interface. So some general rules that are specific uh, for interface measurement. Uh, in order to work properly, the dielectric between the two uh, liquids uh, must be different. And the more different they are, the, the better off, uh, the better off you are. A bare probe, if they are both non-conductive. Uh, coated probe, if only one of them is conductive. Uh, and this is a common application in oil and gas. So for example, water uh, we know is very conductive. Uh, oil is not conductive. So good application for a three-phase separator uh, would be um, a coated uh, capacitance probe. And then sheath probe if we need to increase sensitivity. So just cherry pick some um, key facts there. Okay, what are the advantages of capacitance probes? They're simple, they're rugged, they don't have any moving parts. They can handle a wide range of phys uh, physical properties. They're easy to clean. Disadvantages, uh, sensitive to changes in dielectric uh, and dielectric changes with uh, temperature and density. There's a Big relationship there just like there is an electrical when we're talking about uh, the resistance of a wire for example is a uh, it's a function of the cross-sectional area and the temperature and there's a bunch of variables that that change the electrical characteristics so uh, that's one of the things you have to be concerned with uh, not good for uh, foaming liquids and as we see here uh, finally came out and said it cannot measure the interface of two conductive fluids I don't know if I, I don't know if the ILM contradicts itself there or not, but we'll see. Okay, could uh, have problems with sticky liquids. Um, so foam, sticky, not necessarily good. So that is capacitance when we're talking about capacitance in, in uh, continuous measurements. So 4 to 20 milliamp kind of style uh, dynamic measurement. Next, we'll look at it uh, as a point level device here. So uh, again, just simplified quite a bit when we make it a point level device. It's essentially uh, a switch. Uh, here we have an example of a, of a two wire point level detector. Uh, same exact principles as continuous level detection. One 
Uh, one probe forms the plate and the vessel forms the other. Nothing new and exciting there. Uh, can be used horizontally or vertically. And one thing uh, here to point out, cable capacitance uh, changes with temperature as well. Uh, so this may also uh, modify your measurement variable. So that I, I'm going to say probably fairly insignificant, um, but it is mentioned in the IOM. So again, uh, again, if you're remembering wire science from first year uh, electrical or instrumentation, I guess for that matter, you, you learn that uh, temperature uh, has an effect on resistance, and of course, resistance has an effect on conductivity, and yada yada yada. So again, that temperature change could have uh, possible effect, although not probably significant. Okay, sensitive to process coatings. Again, we've mentioned that earlier. Uh, three uh, three wire capacitance type detector here. So now you'll see there's uh, three different uh, wires. Why why do we have this? Uh, the third wire uh, is what we call a coat shield, which isolates the probe so that coating is not a problem. So you'll see here we've got one wire connected here to that. We've got one wire that's connected to the tank essentially, and then one wire that's connected to the probe. And this allows the ground to be isolated, uh, and that's a way of dealing with coating issues. Okay, this is good for all types of material, including conductive ones that leave a coat. So very obscure little question possibilities there. Okay, summary of capacitance here can be used for continuous or point level measurement. Temperature can affect the dielectric of the process as well as the cables, so you need to be aware and compensations may be needed to, uh, to be added to the transmitter, although I'm sure nowadays it's already included. Uh, for interface measurements, the dielectrics have to be significantly different or preferably significantly different. Simple, rugged, no moving parts measure a wide range of physical properties, sensitive to dielectric changes, not good for foaming liquids, cannot measure the interface between two conductive liquids, uh, process buildup and sticky fluids are bad. Okay, so that's all those wonderful points there. Here we have a video. Shall we try our luck today? And let me know if you guys don't get this video. Capacitive level measurement offers a wide. Are we getting it? I think you just got to share a different screen, Ty, possibly. All right. All right. This is uh, this is where life goes to heck in a handbasket. Working on the science. Working on the science here. Stop sharing this screen. Start sharing this screen. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. My life sometimes. Video yes or video no? No, back to the PowerPoint screen. Okay, let's see how this video yes or video no? No. Dang. <laughs> how can this be so difficult? Yeah. Now, all righty. A variety of possibilities for level monitoring in liquids and bulk solids. The space between two unevenly charged objects is called an electric field. In this space, one electric charge exerts a force on another charge. The strength and direction of the electric field is shown by lines of flux. If an alternating voltage is applied to a parallel plate capacitor, current starts flowing. The strength of the current depends on the dielectric material between the plates, for example, air or a medium. The dielectric material increases the capacity of the capacitor and thus 
the current flow. The principle of capacitive level measurement depends on capacity changes. This method takes advantage of the fact that products and tanks have a different dielectric constant than air or gases. To measure levels or limits, a probe inside of the tank and the electrically conducting tank wall form a capacitor. As the rising level covers the probe, the measured capacity changes and the cover is detected. As the level falls, the probe reports that it is uncovered due to the change in capacity. If conductive buildup sticks to the probe, this is recognized as a change in capacity in relation to air, comparable to a product. In this case, the lines of flux run directly through the buildup to the tank wall. Even if the product does not cover the probe, it reports covering erroneously. Endresenhauser has developed a capacitive probe with active buildup compensation. The probe has an additional protective electrode with the same potential as the measuring probe, which not only generates one electric field, but two identical fields. The shielding effect of the active buildup compensation prevents a direct current flow along the probe electrode to the tank wall. Therefore, the current of the probe does not flow in the area of the buildup, but only in the area of the actual cover. This principle enables the probe to measure reliably, even in spite of strong conductive buildup. Endresenhauser offers you capacitive probes with active buildup compensation for both liquids and bulk solids. Precise and safe measurement for your application. All right, uh, hopefully back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, you bet. All right, that was a lot easier than getting out of the PowerPoint. All right, so that was capacitance. Uh, moving on next here to thermal dispersion. Um, thermal level, very, very, very simple. Nothing, nothing too major here. This is a lot uh, more straightforward. So here's the thermal level detector. You see here we have two different probes. Uh, one of them is essentially heated. Uh, they both have sensors in, in them, and basically what they're doing is they're trying to uh, either keep these two probes at the same temperature and detecting uh, a difference, or vice versa. Um, these are almost exclusively point-level devices here, um, but super simple. Basically, the change in temperature uh, is the temperature sensed by one, which is heated, subtracted uh, by two. Uh, the second one, which is not heated. Uh, and the idea is here, if they're, if they're not covered in something, the temperatures will be quite a bit different. And if I was to insulate them, wrap them up together or cover them up in a process, the temperatures would be uh, closer together. And that's how the, the science of it works. Okay, so these devices operate on the thermal dispersion principle. Um, a bridge circuit detects a difference in temperature between the heated or active probe and the unheated or reference probe. Uh, again, basic science here, when in a vapor or air, the probe temperature will be quite different. And then when in a denser medium, the temperatures would be more similar, indicating that the level is achieved or it's been surrounded by something. Okay, here's what it looks like in a fancy uh, little picture here, our wonderful old friend, the Wheatstone Bridge. Uh, heated probe, unheated probe, uh, there's the heater, and then again, just the difference between the two probes is measured uh, with our Wheatstone bridge. Okay, used for point level detection devices, just like any other type of point level device, uh, any kind of switch, um, where you put it is where it's going to work. So vertically, horizontally, uh, whatever blows your hair back. Okay, uh, no real calibration per se. Uh, it's either thermally different or it's not. Um, 
just like other devices, we want to make sure we're we're not mounting these in the way of turbulence, agitation, or under the the flow of uh, falling debris. Uh, many different connection types, from threaded to flanged. Uh, to big flanges, we got uh, removable packing glands here. Um, I'm going to hit the next slide because I don't know if I mentioned it or not. No, I don't. Uh, so one thing that is important, and I'm just going to scoot back here, is you, again, of course, these are just little probes here, so you don't want them, particularly if you're measuring some kind of a solid, for example, you don't want them to take any abuse, uh, and you also don't really want stuff uh, to be building up on them. So you want to be taking uh, considerations uh, for that. So if there's shapes to these where they're less prone for stuff to build up on, those are, that's probably how you're going to want to orientate it. To me, it looks like this is flatter on top uh, than it is on the side, kind of like a, a wall plug-in. So you'd want to turn it so that it has the, the least chance uh, of collecting stuff. Okay, uh, zip, zip, next up. Optical level measurement. So optical uh, implies some kind of light or something to that nature here. So uh, these devices work in three general ways. Uh, three of the ways that we look at anyway, light reflection, light refraction, and light transmission. So we'll look at the differences between these here. Okay, first reflective. Uh, Self-explanatory, I'm pretty sure you guys understand reflecting here, light comes out. Uh, if there's something to bounce off of, it bounces off of it, uh, like we see here, uh, and then it is detected, pretty straightforward. Okay, then the, uh, the light can be visible light or infrared light, uh, can be calibrated to measure from a quarter to 12 inches below the sensor, so I'm not hugely um, Big ranges here. Used for clear, translucent, reflective, and opaque processes. And if we use multiple photo cells, we can get multiple level measurements. So it's kind of like uh, like an array. You'd have to have uh, different detectors at different heights, and then by the changing of this angle with the fluid going up and down, uh, would make this reflected light shine on a different. Uh, sensor and you could get more range out of it that way kind of like we uh, kind of like we looked at uh, what was that in in nuclear I believe where we had multiple detectors uh, in an array to uh, expand our range okay second technology is called light refraction okay and the sensor uh, emitter sends out light again either visible or infrared light uh, if the sensor is in air or a gas the light is reflected back to a receiver inside the sensor. And the next diagram will show this a little bit better. Uh, if the sensor is submerged inside a liquid, the light is then refracted uh, into the liquid and is not seen by the receiver. So the difference here is basically uh, a mirror versus the crystal uh, hanging in grandma's window. So let's look at that here a little closer. So what's going on inside the 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 tip of the quartz reflector here. This is it in the larger view here. So when in air, the light will simply bounce off the back of the prism and reflect back into the device itself. When it's in a liquid, it refracts or divides or breaks apart uh, through that prism and gets dispersed into the process medium and not back to the sensor, and that is how it determines whether it's in or out uh, of a process. Okay, um, as a result of, of this fact that light's kind of got to travel, you, might, you cannot use this in slurries uh, or liquids that coat the sensor. Um, again, multiple sensors can be used for multiple level measurements. Not continuous, but you know, like low level, low, low level, high level, high, high level, that type of thing. Okay, light transmission, uh, trans transmissivity. Uh, we've, we talk about uh, transmitting type uh, gas detectors. Uh, same kind of principle here is where we're going. Uh, transmitter on one side, receiver on the other side, and we're transmitting light through the medium. And depending on uh, the characteristics of the medium, 
uh, more light or less light will make it through to the other side. Uh, this is good for slurries, uh, also good for interface, uh, interface levels. Last but not least here, uh, laser level detectors. Uh, these are becoming popular. Uh, provides a, a nice non-contact, so we really haven't looked at anything that was non-contact, so this is a good characteristic for, uh, for lasers. Uh, great for difficult applications, and this is probably why we haven't seen them aside from uh, the technology just developing. Um, they're, they're used for specific applications, right? Uh, and this is, this is one of those uh, great process application type questions. Uh, molten metals is a great example. Uh, sulfur is another great example, uh, things like that. Okay, can be used as point uh, level measurement, um, or you could get them motorized and they can be used for continuous level and thickness measurements. Pulsed laser sensor uh, mentioned in a different lecture here. If you see uh, transmitters that have a constant beam or a pulsed laser sensor, uh, the pulsed versions are usually more powerful and that holds true uh, here as well. Uh, this is the most popular uh, and powerful type. Uh, good range through dust and steam. And you can see here, if you um, look at what's going on, the signal being sent out, reflected back, uh, you see some fancy uh, similar variables here, distance, time, divided by two. So very similar um, to the time of flight principle that we talked about with uh, ultrasonic and radar as well. Okay, continuous wave. Uh, again, very similar to radar uh, in operation, um, better suited for short ranges uh, and clean settings uh, like in a lab. So this is not one that you typically uh, see used for a level of the field. Okay, triangulation method here, again, um, not used for level, but uh, worth noting. Um, this is what we're looking at an array here, and they don't really show it as, a, as an array. Um, but there's be several detectors in one housing here. And again, as the level goes up and down, it changes the angle uh, of reflection and it'll uh, focus the beam on this sensor or this sensor or this sensor or this sensor. And, and doing it that way, we can tell, uh, you know, quarter, half, three quarters full, that, that type of thing. Okay, installation and calibrations of laser sensors. And there's a little bit of overlap here um, in lasers. Um, to uh, radars that we talked about uh, last lecture here when we're talking about this arrangement uh, with flanges and uh, spray rings and sight glasses and, and ways to keep it clean and or ways to clean it if it does get dirty. Uh, so there's some uh, similarities in this installation uh, method. Uh, lasers are placed on the outside uh, of the process uh, obviously being non-contact sight glass uh, will often in, implement a spray ring uh, using air or water uh, or a process compatible fluid to keep the window clean so it's hard to tell in this diagram here but basically um, if we talked about that uh, radar detector from the other lecture where there's a teflon window in here same kind of idea there's a window uh, between the transmitter and the, and the process this ring is the next line of defense. And if that were to get covered with dust and stuff, rather than having to pull it, you just hit it with a blast uh, of, again, air or water or whatever the process medium is in order to clean it off. <clears throat> okay, um, point calibration methods are what we use for lasers. There's uh, not really much of uh, anything that you can do here again. So you, you put it where you want it and you kind of set it. Okay, next up uh, and last up is magnetostrictive. Uh, fancy, fancy name here. A um, bunch of different uh, fancy words in here, but long story short, if you worked on uh, one of these bridal uh, style level gauges that have, uh, you know, the flipping triangles in there, you know, the flippy, flippy triangles that uh, give you the, the reading through the, through the glass. Um, that is a magnetostrictive uh, style level transmitter. So how they work, uh, not, many, not many things going on here. Um, 
there's a magnetic float assembly that moves up and down uh, the shaft. So you can see it in here. Uh, it floats and goes up and down, up and down the shaft here. Uh, we have a piezomagnetic sensor, uh, and then we have some electronics that uh, send a current pulse down here. And, and basically what happens is the current pulse is sent down here. Uh, it gets uh, intercepted by the float wherever that happens to be. Uh, it, in return, creates what's called a torsional wave uh, return pulse, and that gets sent back up to the sensor. And then through the electronics, they calculate the, the distance that it uh, has traveled. Well, very dramatic. Okay, magnetostrictive level sensors are a float type sensor uh, in the way that we have a permanent magnet sealed inside of a float which travels up and down the stem. Again, same diagram. Ideal for high accuracy continuous level measurement of a wide variety of liquids in tanks. Proper choice of float based on the specific gravity of the liquid. So you did that type of thing in first or second year when you talked about uh, buoyancy uh, specific to the application, of course, uh, and uh, a good good device. They actually can use these for uh, custody transfer, and we'll talk about that in another unit. Okay, because of the degree of uh, accuracy possible, uh, we can use these for custody transfer. Well, I guess we're going to talk about it sooner rather than later. Um, it is also frequently applied on magnetic site gauges and those are the ones that we most common commonly see or magnetrol is one of the common brands i think if i remember correctly uh, but whether it's another high temperature or pressure applications take advantage of the performance qualities of these magnetostrictive and uh, if you've worked in any relatively large size uh, plant you more than likely have dealt with these okay here's uh, more uh, common representation of, of uh, a magnetostrictive device here. So here it is, it's clamped on the, clamped on the side of one of these magnetic uh, level devices here. These are the ones I'm talking about with the color changing flippy triangles there. So again, principle of operation, <clears throat> uses the speed of a torsional wave to find the float and report its position. Uh, the float contains a permanent magnet and it sits on top of the fluid. Uh, short current pulse is sent down the tube, creating a magnetic field around the tube. The field reacts with the magnets in the float, causing a wave that travels back up the tube. And that piezoelectric sensor senses the time between the current pulse and the returning torsional wave in order to calculate the distance to the float. Okay, applications uh, and calibration. Uh, clean liquids, um, good with foam and good with interfaces. And actually, they're probably most commonly used on interface uh, applications. And here you see an interface application where you actually have two different floats. Uh, again, picking the float isn't uh, and related to the relative density of the uh, process medium. Okay, uh, calibration. Um, Wet calibration again, typically the best way to do it. Um, you can do it. You can do it physically with a piece of wire. I'm sure there's probably some of you out there that have done that without having to change the vessel. But basically, you move the float uh, up and down into that position, uh, one way or another, and that's how you do the calibration. Okay, installation, uh, just like we saw earlier, can be mounted internally to the vessel or externally in a in a bridle type situation. Uh, things to consider, of course, don't don't bend the probe or the cables or any of, uh, you know, any of this stuff. It's going to be free to move up and down here. Um, I'm not sure why this image, this specific image uh, is in the ILM, but it shows you the C-clip that uh, holds the, the float on. And I guess maybe they show that because there is a good possibility that um, the the density or specific gravity of your process medium uh, could change in a vessel and you may have to change this float out for a proper one uh, so there you go that's the that's the golden key all right there we are at the end of 310302f um, hopefully that wasn't too bad for you again just a little bit of math uh, in the capacitance probes there and again 
uh, cylindrical and metric is what most of our calculations are going to be. The end. <laughs>